Okay, so hi, hello, welcome back. I'm here with a friend of mine, this guy called Jacob. Uh, where do you, where are you from, Jacob? I am from Brooklyn, New York. So he's Born like he's, he's like a Gormali, uh super fan. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's basically he's here to help my channel. He's helped me a lot with my channel. He's called, uh, a guy called pleasure. Jacob Lovey, right? Yeah. Lovey, Lovey. Yeah. Lovey. And you're from Brooklyn. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you know you know I was talking about um famous guy from Brooklyn earlier, famous chess player from Brooklyn. Can you guess who it was? I have no idea, honestly. Bobby Fisher. Oh, but how did I not think of that? <laughs> Bobby Fisher, of course. Because I was talking about a game that I played against James Howe, who was like the English Bobby Fisher. I thought you were going to say the game I played against Bobby Fisher. <laughs> No, no, I never played Bobby Fischer. No, I never played him. I would have loved to have played Bobby Fischer. I was like, idolised him when I was younger. Um, but he was like, he's basically out of the chess team by the time I started playing chess. Mm -hmm. So it was more like actually Kasparov and Nigel Short that I looked up to. But who did you, did you uh, admire any chess players when you were younger, Jacob? No, nah, I just got into chess recently, so. Um... Right, right. So you didn't but, look up to any? Did you look up to anyone at all? Oh, there's this grandmaster from England. Oh, and, that guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so what would you? What are we going to do today? We're going to like. I think we're going to. You're going to share some uh, study material, and we're going to go through and talk about your your thoughts. And where I'm, I'm going I'm to try and do some input myself. On what I'm studying, like right now. Yeah. As in games or just well, like, annotations. Uh, You're gonna. You said you had some annotations. We're gonna no, look. no, no. I, I didn't get to get any annotations because we're gonna play a tournament yesterday and annotate like the games, but I wasn't able to make right, it to the tournament. Right, right, So should I should I maybe do some uh, test you on some positions? Yeah, sure. Um, that might be that might be a good idea. I'll test you on some positions, and. We go through your thought process. Why your thought process might be wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first, actually, I'm going to test you on a position that I was just looking at myself, and uh, so I'll do share screen. Okay, I'm sharing now. So Jacob, can you see this? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Can I think it'd be better. Could you send it to me on Skype? Because I, I have you on my phone on Skype, and then, right, like I'll open up on my laptop. So how do I how do I send it? How, what you mean? I send the game. Here, got... I think it'll be better. Yeah, yeah. Just send me the link to that that oh, study right, or whatever. Okay, right. Okay. Okay. Let me get the key position. Or the fen, whatever it's called. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me get the position. Right. Uh, do, 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 do. uh, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. So, part of my French. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how this is going to work though. If I, if you can't see my screen, this could be a bit. Here, bit here. Of an issue. I'll, I'll just connect on my laptop. It'll be better. Give me one, one second. second. Yeah. All right. I'll disconnect and I'll reconnect. Okay. Hello. Welcome back. Right. Are you? Are you there? Hello? Oh. Hello? It doesn't seem to be there. Yeah. Bit of an issue, go ongoing issue here.
Yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, you're back. My... Yeah, I thought about I trying to restart the computer. Give me one second. Dun dun. All right, I hear you now. Um, I'm not on my whatever. I'll just analyze off of my phone. It's all right. Yeah. So here you can share the screen. We could cut it out, by the way, in post production. What I got up there. Hmm. Right, so I can try to share screen with you, yeah? Yeah, yeah you could do it now, yeah. Okay. But it's, it's going to be maybe a little bit different because I'm not so used to sure. like doing it from a small screen. But... Right, right, no problem. So can you see uh, my screen now? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit small, but yeah. Okay, okay. So I was black in this game. This game was played many years ago. Mm -hmm. In the English Chess League. And I was playing against a guy called James Howe. Um, so if you're black here, what? Okay, he's, he's got an arrow here suggesting the move e5. Is there any other options for black? What would you? How would you assess the position? So a big issue with me is assessing the position. So I'll try to. Yeah. Like, where should I even start by? Like, like listing. Hmm. Like well, there's, there's, there's various ways that you assess the position. One of them is, obviously, you look at the material, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, generally, when stronger players assess positions, Jacob, it's, a lot of it is to do with uh, instinct, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got a certain amount of experience that you've built up. So you're doing a lot of it subconsciously. You're not necessarily... Um, you're not necessarily doing it, you know, you, you're not speaking to yourself. You're not going, oh, I'm in the materials level. You're just doing it subconsciously. And to be honest with you, all chess players uh, assess positions. You know, that is instinctively thing that you do subconsciously anyway. Uh, but the thing I try to get across to people that I coach is is that you annotate your games. So that mm -hmm. you put in assessment. So if I'm putting in an assessment here, for example, I will put in um, what I think of the position. So how would you put in the position? Would you say here that white is better, uh, white is slightly better? I'm saying from what I see, let me see the position. Yeah. Um, from what I see right now, hmm. I, I don't really, I, I hear this a lot. Like, let's say black has the bishop here, right? I don't sure. know how strong that really is sure. because... Like, I would consider this a close position, right? Right. Or actually, right. is this close? It's, it's. I wouldn't say it's close. No, because it's not the like center really is close. Because like, mm. whatever. But um, like the the bishops are not really doing much. White does no. have a lot of space. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's good assessment. But the thing yeah. is, I I understand these concepts, but I don't know how important. Each one is compared to the other. You know what I mean? Uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where your experience comes in, and your and your instinct. So you've identified a couple of factors. First, you said uh, the bishops aren't doing very much, which is true. But on the other hand, you could also argue. Sometimes the way I look at it is looking at the, the positive side of the position. So I'll say, well, black. Yes, the bishops aren't doing much, but on the other hand. In the long term, they're a, they're a big asset. I hear that. I've got the dark squares, which is good. You've identified the fact that white has a space advantage, which is a very important point, that white is potentially maybe threatening g5, pushing the knight away, creating attacking chances on the king's side. Uh, this is a very double-edged opening, actually. It originates from... Well, that's another test, actually. What opening does this originate from? If I had to test you, your knowledge. 
with chess. Mm. This is going to be a, I think this is a very interesting uh, position because it looks like uh, White is castled, like it's opposite side castling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have no idea, to be honest. It, it actually originated from the Sicilian night off. Yeah. Oh, I could see mm. from the, where the knights are. So how old are you, Jacob, and how long have you been playing chess for? I'm 18, and I've been playing for about eight months. Oh, so you're a pretty young guy, right? And you're at college at the moment, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so you're you're studying full time. And what do you what do you intend to do uh, with your life when you're older? Are you gonna do chess or are you gonna do something else? I'm saying I don't know if I can make a living off of chess, but yeah. I'm not really sure where where life will take me, but I yeah. but I'm confident if I put like my hundred percent into anything that I'll be able to achieve whatever mm. I strive to do. Yes, yes, I'm the same. Yeah, like I'm no, I'm the opposite. I'm not the opposite. I just don't think I'm going to achieve anything, and anything I put my mind to, I will fail at. You know, that's not a good mindset. <laughs> that's not a good mindset. Yeah. But in this position, you're a grandmaster. People, yeah, strive for their whole life to be a grandmaster. And no, that's right. Short, yeah, so. I think sometimes you I forget. I forget about uh, what an achievement it is. And when I was, uh, for many years, I was kind of in the wilderness. And I'd already achieved a GM title. And I should have kicked on from there. And I should have done a lot of work on chess. But I was sort of like going through the motions. It's, it's funny how life works like that. And now I regret that because I'm older. And I regret all those years. But obviously, I've still got the opportunity to do that now. I've still got the opportunity. To... You know, a lot of chess players, Jacob, to be honest with you, they... Um, they don't actually work, you know, a lot of professional players, they don't actually work that hard on chess. You'd assume they were doing, they'd be doing five, six hours a day minimum mm -hmm. because you've got X amount of hours in the day that you can do that for. But my, most of the people, most of my friends don't do anything like that. And that's probably why we're kind of stuck at the 24, 2500 level. The guys that do uh, five or six that'd hours. That would be a good issue to have for me, honestly. <laughs> yeah. To be stuck at 24, 12. 2500 <laughs> it would be a good issue but i think i think actually if you were a gm you would probably be one of those people who would be working and what i get from speaking to you you're probably one of those people who would be working hard on chess full time and if you were doing chess rather than if, if like, i could i would man. yeah oh my gosh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but chess um, is the kind of game that rewards like hard work if you put in a lot of work you'll get better at it, you know, like, there's no, there's no doubt about that in my mind, like, if, if you put the work in, you'll get better, it's just a question of how much time you're willing to invest, um, you know, are you working on the right things as well, but in general, just hard work pays off full stop. Yeah, I went from, let's say I started in the summer, like, in July, I think so, um, I went from, my my first ELO, like after playing a bunch of games on chess.com, was 270, which is atrocious. Mm -hmm. And I, I got, got myself, myself up to now I'm hovering from like 14 to 1500 rapid, like it goes around there. So, so it's not bad. I mean, for somebody who hasn't played much, that's not bad. You know, there's a lot of players that would be quite happy with that. It's probably been played for many years, right? Yeah, yeah I, I would, would say, say so. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I, would I would consider, consider like. like I'm, I'm pretty, pretty old, old to get, get into, into chess. chess. Like, so my yes. ceiling might not be as high, but yes, um, willing to become the best I could. Yeah, that's all you can do, really. I mean, you know, all you can do is try your best, right? Yeah, so I had this thing. I was thinking, like, oh, why didn't I get into chess when I was younger? I was angry at myself, right? But I'm like, yeah. who knows? Maybe I wouldn't have liked chess when I was younger. And also, like... But you learned maybe earlier, right? But you only started playing properly. Yeah, I, I was 270 elo. That that's how good I was. I knew how the pieces moved, but yeah. I, we could look through our games, my old games, a different time. But they're hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, the main thing is you're enthusiastic. If you want to learn, you want to get better. I mean, that's really like 50 percent of the battle, I think. Um, but this position, what candidate moves is black ad? So where, oh, where, no, so, 
So when I calculate Jacob, I'm often thinking about candidate move. So I identify candidate move. And then the process, which I think is a very good process, is you then try to see if there's anything wrong with that candidate move. Does it lose tactically? Is it bad? If it's not bad, then obviously that would then come to the forefront of the move that you would choose. So in this position, what candidate moves does Black have? So, uh, of course, it already showed with the edge and arrow, like mm. um, taking space and also attacking the knight sure. by pushing the, sure. the e pawn. Mm. Looks good. Um, at, at first, like my first instinct was to like sort of think out of the bishop, but I realized that just loses a pawn. Right. Um, right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So if you go here, they're, they're going to take it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Which and, is not good. Um, there is. So that that's Pat, what I would call. Castle, sorry, Castle sorry to interrupt. Lee. Sorry what? to interrupt. That's what I would call falsify the variation. So you've gone bishop b7. So that's what I was talking about when you're trying to see what's wrong with the move as well, and that that is a good calculation method that you're trying to use calculation to as a process of elimination. So you go mm -hmm. right that move I don't play. It's as process of elimination because you've seen that this this move is is good for white. So you saw, you've seen that e5 is a move. You've, you've seen that bishop b7. Anything else? Um, tasseling looks okay. Um, Tasseling's a good move, yeah. Right. And then I'm trying to think. Anything else? So we got two. I'm saying attacking the knight. I don't. Maybe that does something. I'm not sure. The only problem is that if no, you no. Go I'm there, saying with the with the queen, with the queen. No, but with the I don't queen, think it does anything. Doesn't really attack it. Any other moves? What about to activate that rook on b8? Hmm. Interesting. I'm not sure where I would activate it. Oh. Oh, uh, no. I wouldn't know where to activate it. Maybe by pushing the... Which pawn is that? The, the b pawn? Yeah. That's another move I would say. It's, it's funny, actually, because when you play the knight in the lot, there's certain ideas that you know almost automatically. Like, you, you, it took you a while to see that that was an idea to push the pawn. Yeah. Because I've played Nidor for many years, I know that B4 in these kind of positions is just a very standard plan for black. You don't even have to think about it. It's almost like an automatic move. So you open up the B file, which is obviously useful. You've activated the rook. Now, it's interesting, after here, what is the best move? This is a good test. So he's the threatening the knight. He's threatening the knight. Um, so what is the best move for black? What would you play here? This is a good test. What would I play? Probably like D2. To, I mean like, Knight I'm E7, sure. you mean? E7, yeah. But are you not worried about this pawn? Oh, I am. Um, am I? I'm thinking of like counterattacking with the knight, but it's pro Oh, I'm not worried about that because I attack with the knight and I take back. And if you take? And... Ooh, that's not good. Not good, yeah. Not good. Yeah. That's not good. There is an amazing so, move here. I don't know if you can see it. There's an amazing idea here, which the computer points out, which which I think I already showed in another video that I recorded earlier. Well, let me think. Black, uh, black to play. But I didn't see this during the game. I was already quite a decent player. If I'd have seen this, it might have made for a very interesting battle. Uh, what's the move? The move is know. just a castle. What? Which looks insane, right? Because you lose a piece for nothing. But then the problem is when you take, you're hitting a knight, right? So you're immediately threatening to regain your piece. Your king is now very safe, which is very important. And now, potentially, you can start to think, even though peace down, you can start to think about counterattack against the white king, where you're fairly safe on the king side for the time being. So when they go here, the computer says that after a5, the position is actually about equal. Wow. Which is incredible, yeah. right? Because if it's I'd seen this variation in the game, I might have gone down in history as maybe the most genius idea ever. Uh, but this is the time. I mean, that's actually the computer variation. This is one of the reasons, Jacob, why 
you know, working with computers can be inspiring because they can come up with ideas that we often find difficult to come by. You know, it's very difficult to just imagine just casting there and just giving up the piece for nothing. Uh, going back to this position, um, well, I'll actually show you what happened in the game. I, I went h6 and uh yeah it, it all started going wrong because he went g5 hit my knight and um he came up with a very clever idea here he actually went knight g3 apparently i was supposed to go queen b6 i went queen c5 can you predict his next move white to play i could flip the board as well what would you play here as why how would you how would you attack Mm. I think he came up with quite a good idea. Oh no, hang on, he played King B1 first, sorry. Now I went here, so it's white to play here. So obviously he's played that because he doesn't want to lose the knight, so he's worried about me going check and then taking the knight. So he's gone King B1, I went here. So now white to play. What would you play here? White to play. Mm. Oh, this is very. I'm saying, there's there's a hanging pawn. I say. Oh, but there's also he's gonna take my knight. You're gonna take the knight, yeah. Yeah, if you're not that. careful. So this is where like genius comes in, like this GM genius that he came up with an amazing idea here. Um, but it's it's kind of once you see the move, it's kind of obvious, but it's seen the move in the first place that really and the problem was it was so strong that I almost had to accept a strategically busted position Ooh. quite a good game by White actually to be fair I mean he played a pretty good game I think but... oh hmm. I would think it was a knight move at first, uh, the knight that's protecting the king, but like yeah, the bishop could just take, but. Yeah, yeah, knight d5 is going to take, yeah, bishop takes d5, exactly. If there wasn't a bishop there, it could have been a good move. Possibly, although you can still take on g3, because it's only one check on c7, right? Then I can move the king. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily that, that strong for white. I know if it's a crazy move, it's probably sacrificing the knight or something, but... Yeah, he went, he played f6, because the idea oh. is, if you take here, he's going to take here, which is nasty. Very nasty. I um, actually calculated that, hmm. or something like that, before I, I realized the knight was hanging. So, I just factored it out the second. Like, yeah, so sometimes... I, I realized I was sacrificing material. With your calculation, Jacob, you try to take it out a little bit like a move further so one of the key aspects of calculation which i think a lot of amateur players fall down on is uh they'll give up on the line too quickly so they'll see a move and they're like oh f6 but then the knight's hanging and then they'll stop calculating they'll give up too quickly right so i think with calculation you've got to train yourself to go that little bit further and and just you know, get used to like, like, you know, not giving up on lines too quickly. So a lot of it is just about training your calculation, really getting good at chess. You know, that's the that's the like the uh, meat and drink of chess playing, right? Chess tournament play is just calculation. Uh, but f6 is a very nasty move, Jacob, because the point is, if I take, he's, I understood he's going to go knight f5. So flip the board, attack the queen. But when the queen moves, the knight comes in, he's got a nasty attack. It's just going to, you know, I might be a pawn up, but it's just a very nasty position. Um, he can go like check, and it's just horrible. Oh, well. So I realized I'm busted. So I decided I'm going to, right, stop the knight coming to f5. The problem was, very clearly, that the problem was, well, what's the issue here for black, the biggest issue? For black, mm. um, da, da, da. 
think one issue I see at first is that the queen is like just harassing the position. The queen on and, HA. And, yeah. 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 And exactly. it's also pinning a piece. So that's not good. Mm. Um, another issue. It's quite. Oh, it just, it just, it's, yeah. it's not that safe in the center. No, no, so there's, there's quite a few issues. Like, for example, yeah, you identify the queen is very active. My 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 king is in the center, so it's not safe. Um, the center is quite open. He's got a default. He's attacking down a default. So a number of issues here that are good for white. And one of, one of the issues, which is really important, that bishop is effectively out of the game. It's a pre I'm effectively a piece down. Unless I can play the move d5 and free it, I can never move the bishop. So I'm effectively what, playing... Sorry, yeah. I don't know if I vocalised it, but that's what I meant. Like, by the piece mm. being pinned, it's like pretty much not there. Yeah, I'm not in the game. So I went... Uh, he went here and, and eventually played a very clever move. So now the bishop is basically entombed forever. It's like... It's like the unknown soldier. It's in his tomb. Right? Wait, go back to the moves, like... The, the moves before oh that's oh that's very interesting so you you took it and he just like shut it out forever yeah 95 was a very classy move because he's basically um he's playing against his bishop so he's just trying to he's just trying to win strategically so he's not trying to do anything clever he's not trying to like win with brilliant tactics he's just trying to win strategically he was a more experienced player than me at the time and a much more experienced player and he effectively he could win just on class alone because he's a much stronger player um and really I, I think i got the opening wrong and yeah basically after that he just basically outclassed me but um and i, and I lost the game and and here at the end he's yeah i think i actually resigned here because i suddenly realized he's going to go here and take here and then just win the queen and the queen and stuff. So I really got outplayed really because I didn't find a solution to the opening. Um, and it's a tough school when you play GM level because I effectively made one mistake which was to go H6. And after that White well, was clearly better and he just outplayed me from that point on and effectively made it very difficult for me to ever gain any counterplay. So, it is, it's a tough school. Let me see if there's any other puzzles I can show you. Uh, or maybe we could just do puzzles full stop. Let's do, let's do a, should we do a puzzle? All right, that sounds good. Let's do a puzzle. Actually, what I'll do is I'll log out and then we'll do, should we do a normal puzzle together rather than, because I've got, I've, my, some of my puzzles are very tough, so I'm going to log out. Yeah. We'll just do a normal puzzle. Right, so this puzzle is black to move. Find the best move for black. Because I know you're, not, you're an inexperienced player, so it's not, yeah. like, it's not a good idea to give you really tough puzzles. So I'm thinking queen, b5, and then yeah. if you go, I think it's like checkmate in two or three or something like that. Yeah, yeah, well so, calculated. So, so yeah. So, so you've queen, got queen B5. B5 right? no, no, don't move them. And then and then you just check him and check him again, and then it's submit. Yeah. So when when you use calculation, guys, right? When you're watching at home, um, the same thing for Jacob. Look for checks and captures. So the first thing that Jacob was thinking was a check, like a, because the reason you look for checks and captures is they're forcing moves. Uh, if you if you give a check, they have to respond to the check. If you play like a waiting move, they they've got more choice. They can do what, whatever they like. But if if you play a forcing move, like a forcing move, so that's why they say to you, look at your checks and captures first, because then you you know if the if the checks and captures don't work, you can then move on to the other less forcing variations. But it's a good way to train your calculation, and uh, yeah, so queen b five. Uh, King C1, and then we're going to go check, right? Yeah, but I don't think I really struggle with my calculation. I think I, I, I really struggle on, like, strategy. Mm. When it comes to strategy and, like, positional understanding, I, I, 
like. Right, let's see if I can I find a study that I've got. Hang on, I'll have to sign in. Sign back in again. Uh, maybe I can sign in with this. Let's see if I can find uh, my studies. Uh, where's a good study that I can find? Uh, actually, this one's a decent one because this is more strategical. Right. Um, so again, it's got these silly arrows. So white to play. How would you? So this is this is kind of like a typical middle game. You were saying this is a game I played the other week actually. Played this game about eight days ago. It was in the British Rapid Play Championships. We're playing against Shreyas Royal. I was black. Shreyas Royal is, you know, potentially a future British number one, I would say, uh, in chess. He's a very strong junior player. And he was right up there for the whole tournament. And I was black. Uh, how would you... This, is, uh, this, I would say, is a typical strategical position. So, move for white? Yeah, move for white. What would you play? So the first thing I initially think is to take on the C file to take it like he takes. Right. right. And if he mm. takes with a queen or bishop, it doesn't really matter. Just take it with mm. take it with your rook so you control that file. Um, yeah. Right. Another thing I'm thinking is like. Oh no! Another thing I thought was like shutting out the. Dark square bishop by pushing the mm. which pawn the, the the C pawn but like you just give like a the lot e of activity. Pawn, you mean, the e pawn. Yeah, the E pawn, mm. but it it shuts out. It it does shut it out, but it also like makes it really active the the light square bishop. Yeah, that that is a typical idea. But as you've identified, the bishop on B seven. Yeah, and then and then the mm. it yeah. It, it suddenly actually, becomes active. It, 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 it can be placed on d5 as a very good square where it's putting pressure on the queen side. I didn't see that. I just I was just thinking of yeah later down the line where he swings his queen or, yeah, he doubles. Maybe he, like, queen d5 is an it. option for black. Although that would run into knight f4 here. That is an idea, but you, you, you've you identified that there's a drawback to it. So that's already good strategical thinking, that you're thinking about... I mean, often the way uh, you think positionally or strategically is... You got identified plans, right? Yeah, that that's where I mm. usually fall short for my rating. But yeah. I think my my calculation is good for my rating. That's good. That's good. So you got a good starting point. I think calculation is very important. Uh, how can you get better strategically? I mean, one advice would just be to play through a thousand games of Karpov or a thousand games of Mikhail Botvinnik, who are good strategical players. But you could also buy Dvoretsky books. Um, they're quite good. Like they give good advice about strategical thinking. I, I did, did buy a book. I actually have it on me. Yeah. The Amateur's Mind by Jeremy Selman. But I, oh, right. I think it's more of just positional understanding, which I think is different than strategy, right? Slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is they're, they're kind of interlinked, right? I mean, um. I mean, st st strategy, I guess, would be like plans, right? But there's also positional play, natural position play. Like, you, like, what's a good natural positional move here for White? So you've you've talked about trading rooks. Yeah, and then taking control of the fire. Yeah, I mean, another thing I think White could consider is um, playing the move f3. So you know, one way you mm. could. You can actually work on your strategy, I think, or your strategical positional play is to build up your understanding of ideas. And yeah, I don't understand that idea. Yeah, well, the oh, idea is... actually, I do, I do. It's yeah. So now you could push the pawn, and you're not facing issues. You could yeah, push partly, the e pawn. Partly, but it's also partly um, based on Lasker's advice, which was to overprotect. Overprotection. So you're overprotecting the pawn on e4. You're also giving a square for the king, so the king doesn't have any back rank issues. <coughs> um, and the other thing is, which I I learned recently was that I was reading this book by a trainer of Kasparov, and I think that's one way you can build up your positional strategical understanding is to read a lot of chess books. 
and see some of the advice that they give in these kind of books, you know, like Russian kind of advice and all that kind of stuff. And one thing he said, which st stuck in my mind, was which I'd never seen before, even though I've been playing chess for X amount of years. And he said, the old Russian advice is when all your pieces stand well, you make a poor move. And I thought, well, hang on, I never thought about that before. And that's actually quite good advice. So, like, I mean, if you look at White's position, the bishop on d3 stands well. The bishop on e3 is good. The knight on e2 is good. The rook on c oh, Another thing that, I, hmm. that I'm looking at right now is is just trading off the dark square bishops because I think his yeah. dark square bishop is way better than than black. Yeah, yeah, that that no is black actually, is better. I mean. Yeah, that is actually a very standard play. He could have go. He could have played that. Yeah, I've seen this in my games before because I yeah I used to play like a lot of different like like it wasn't really kings in Indian. It was just like the setup. But I didn't mm. understand really the plans behind mm. it. Mm. But I don't really play those type setups anymore. Yeah, so bishop h6 is um, is a good move, actually, Jacob, because as you've identified, the bishop on g7 is quite a good piece. Uh, bishop on e3 at the moment is only really defending the d4 pawn, so you go there, and actually, once you exchange off the dark square bishops, that greatly increases the chances that white will attack on the king side. Um, even though a lot of pieces have been exchanged already, there's still a danger that black will get checkmated on the king side. So the move he played was kind of similar to that, is he went h4. So it's kind of combining two ideas. So one idea was to go f3, which is like all your pieces stand well, so you make a pawn move. Uh, the other Wait, move, so what, what, what is that move? Well, the yeah. idea is he wants to attack on the king side. He wants to play h5. And then either play, uh, so let's say, let's just say I do nothing. He'll go h5, and then he'll either take there, which will weaken my king side defenses, or he'll play the move h6. And again, very important strategical idea that when you move a bishop, you go e5. Um, and then when you uh, drop the bishop back to h8, your bishop's now entombed. You know, a little bit like that, Jay, that game we were just looking at where I had the bishop stuck on f8. Uh -huh. The bishop is now on h. So you see how he's played with strategic. He's played that's, with. Yeah, yeah that's, that's super right. interesting. But why yeah. is the pawn not hanging when he. he well, that, that was something I think he was. Is it a tactic? Yeah, I think he'd seen a similar idea before. Like, he'd obviously studied this opening. And I had some vague re recollection myself that if you go here. Uh, the idea is that white will go here and after queen uh, h5 for example he would go here and now the queen is out of squares oh wow really clever idea right yeah although thinking about it now maybe i can get away with this because how can he win the queen but it's just in general, it's just risky to take, it just felt risky to take that pawn. It just felt like, uh, you know, sometimes you have to believe your opponents. So, I think I understood, Jacob, what his plan was. His plan is to go h5. So, I would say to you, my advice to you, if you want to get better at understanding plans, ideas, you just need to study a lot of chess. If you study games, and also books, buy books on strategy, uh, how they explain the plan, the ideas involved. Um, that that could probably improve your strategic and positional strength, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, funny enough, I lost a game to Stanley Badasconi, and this turned into a tactical mess. But one of the things I noticed about him is I think his tactics are probably better than his strategy. Um, so again, you know, even a good players strategy, you know, you can often the same thing with me, like probably my tactics are better than my positional play, my, my strategy. Um, so you can always improve different aspects of your game. Some players, their positional strength will be, you know, I, I used to coach a kid called Murugan like years ago. Is he Swedish? 
No, nah, no, nah, he's like his family's from Sri Lanka, but he lived in England, and he was a very good junior. He beat me when I was already an international master. He beat me in a Richmond rapid play. He was ten years of age, which is crazy. But one of the things I noticed with him is that tactically he had like a bit of a flaw. Like he would overlook basic tactics sometimes, and I felt like that flaw could hold him back. But eventually he quit chess anyway. He didn't really. I think he lost interest in the game. He wasn't really. He quit because he had weaknesses. He just quit because. What was his rating? Uh, he was a pretty decent player. I mean, he was obviously a good player, right? I mean, I'm not sure how good he was when he quit, but he was probably about 2200 strength. Oh my gosh. You know, but he was a decent player, and he would have been. He probably would have been a GM if he'd carried on playing, right? Um, but he decided that he, he wasn't that interested. In chess, he didn't want to carry on playing chess. Um, so he eventually quit. But I, I felt like if he had a flaw, that it was probably tactically. And some players will be very good strategically and positionally, but they'll be weak tactically. It's like in golf. If you got like some golfers are amazing off off the tee, they're great at driving the ball. Uh, you know, they're great like tee to green, but when they get on the green, they're terrible. And then other players are like the opposite. They're very good short game. They're very good at putting, but like they're very bad like tee to green. Like Jordan Spiff would be a good example. He's not great off the tee, but when he gets on the putting surface, he's amazing. Yeah, so I was talking to one of hmm. my friends that studies here. His name is Samuel. He's a grandmaster as well. Yeah, yeah. And he was telling me at a certain level, yeah. You should just double down on your strengths. And he didn't say like neglect your weaknesses. Let's say for, for him it's like end games, yeah. right? Yeah. So he's like he's like, I'm a tactical player. Or no, maybe he didn't say tactical, but whatever yeah. he was strong in, he would say I would double down on that. So for me I think I just I'm not good enough yet where I could just like like just focus all on my tactics. I feel like I have to be more balanced, you know what I mean? No, no, but that's interesting advice, what you're saying. So it's basically using, like, I think it's called the big claw. Uh, somebody came up with a name where it's like the big claw. So, you, like, you've got a crab, you've got a giant claw, and that is strong enough to guard you against everything. So, if you're so good tactically, you don't need to worry about positional play because basically your, your strengths are going to hide your weaknesses. So, that's interesting what you're saying. But, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you... Yeah, and I think you've identified actually that maybe that wouldn't work for you because you're not good enough tactically as he is. Yeah, so not, he, not even close. Not even close, but yeah, but, but you're good. That is the strength of your game, but you need to... Yeah, I think I think that's it. You need to become rounded. I mean, one of the things I noticed actually, going a few years back, I wrote this book called Pandemic Shark, and... Uh, I worked a lot on my... No, sorry, the, the, the book I just released actually is called Battle Manual. And during the course of it, I worked a lot on my end games, And I actually, I, I didn't know how to make with Knight and Bishop versus King. Which is weird when you're a GM for years. You never, I've never... A lot of technical endings that a lot of GMs would take for granted. I didn't know them. And when I worked on them, I, I realised my chess actually improved a lot because uh, I noticed with my chess, I was trying too hard um, if you're all your eggs in one basket, Jacob, if you're basically just trying to prepare all the time and um, you're spending a lot of time on preparation, on openings, if you don't get that early knockout, you feel kind of exposed. Whereas if I realise that and I realise actually if I do work on my endings, then I feel more confident when the game goes longer than I was doing before. And I realised actually I was quite a good end game player. Um, and I was probably putting too much, I was, I was pushing myself, you know, and I'd start, I'd make impatient decisions because I like, if the game continues the long period, you know. So I started to realise that that was the way forward for me. I would play more technically, I would play more positionally. So that could be, that could be good advice for you. Maybe you try and focus on playing technically, try to outplay people positionally. And then the tactics will just come like easy for you anyway. So you'll you know you'll pick them off with tactics. But you could beat them just by beating them positionally. Yeah. But, 
but I think I think that that's it for today, Jacob. I think you've probably done enough chess for one day. Let's not yeah. over egg the pudding. All right, uh, all right. It's been a yeah good session. I'll see you on Friday. All right, mate. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, what sort of time on Friday? Because I'm traveling on Friday. Um, we can figure it out. We can figure it out after the call. All right. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Okay, so that's the end of the video. Well, thanks to Jacob for appearing on uh, on that with me, and I'll probably release that later today. And then, uh, if anyone else is interested in any coaching or any help or guidance, please get in contact with me. I will list my um, email address below. Just before you get in contact with me, though, I will warn you that I charge fifty pound an hour. It's not cheap, but GMs don't get. We don't get a set salary uh we don't work you know i don't work for 40 hours a week so i'm not making big money from chess you know i might get two or three hours of coaching a week if i'm lucky so it's not it sounds like a lot but i'm not getting paid you know if i was working in a job normal job i'd be working seven uh, maybe five days a week uh let's say i was doing eight hours a day at say 12 15 pound an hour I'll be making more than what I'm making at the moment where I may be only doing two or three hours of chess coaching per week. But I do think that chess coaching is beneficial, can help your chess. Even if we only do two or three hours, I can probably guide you in the right direction. So please get in contact with me if you're interested in any chess coaching. Thank you.